Okay, folks. Well, I think we'll get started. Other people can layer in as uh, as they're able to to join us. But look, th thanks for joining us tonight. I know you guys probably had a busy day, and um, I'm cutting into your evening time. But hopefully, today's presentation will be of value. Um, it's a really important topic um, uh, for for uh, um, uh, graduate veterinarians and and final year students. Something that isn't covered. Uh, at a really uh, um, high level at international veterinary schools, particularly. Um, and uh, uh, when I refer to international, uh, I refer to veterinary schools outside the US. Um, uh, tonight's presentation is on sort of investing in yourself and specifically student debt and, and how to manage it. Uh, this is a really pertinent topic here in the US because uh, the average student debt uh, for students here is about $180,000. Uh, regularly students have over $400,000 of debt um, and it uh, places a significant financial pressure on the veterinary professional and is certainly a part of, of the challenges that veterinarians uh, um, face professionally and financially and is a key contributor to some of the mental health challenges we're, we're facing in the profession right now. So um, for some of the, you guys who, who joined my last webinar about two weeks ago on working in the US, we did touch on uh, the student debt issue. Today, hopefully we'll give you guys some good tools on, on how, to, how to deal with it. So just to introduce myself, um, as you can tell by the accent, I am Australian. Uh, I grew up in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, my mum and dad are still still there as well as my brother. Um, and I started my veterinary degree at, at Melbourne um, and uh, we were due to get American accreditation in my final year, 2005. And with six months to go, we we're informed by the school that the AVMA accreditation had been delayed by a year. Um, and you know, even then it wasn't guaranteed as much as the school felt confident I would get it. So. I, uh, I didn't quite know what to do. I'd just been to a vet conference in New Zealand. My mum's a Kiwi, and so I was a dual citizen. And so I decided uh, to try and transfer to Massey uh, in New Zealand. And, and uh, that all went pretty smoothly. Um, uh, the only downside of transferring to Massey is they wouldn't give me the degree unless I did a third of the course. So I had to repeat a year. And that took me back to uh, halfway through um, uh, uh, fourth year. Uh, at that time, you know, veterinary degree in Melbourne, New Zealand was a five-year degree. And so I uh, um, repeated the second half of uh, um, uh, fourth year and then repeated my fifth year. So probably a good thing. I uh, First time around uh, in Melbourne, I, uh, I wasn't the best student. So, so doing it a second time was, was probably a good outcome. When I left Australia, I was obsessed with fish farming and uh, Paul Hardy Smith, I don't know if he still lectures to you guys. He was a real mentor and inspiration to me. And I was uh, dead set on becoming a, uh, a fish specialist of all things. Uh, but when I got to Massey, I fell back in love with clinical practice um, and uh, time at Massey really sort of uh, changed my course um, and, and uh, uh, re reset me uh, on, on sort of where I wanted to go as a veterinarian. And so for that reason, you know, moving to Massey uh, was, was uh, um, you know, fantastic. And, and obviously Massey was American accredited, which, uh, you know, gave me the option to work in America. That time I didn't know I was going to be in America. I just wanted the option. And uh, at that time, uh, you know, Melbourne uh, wasn't, wasn't accredited. But I feel pretty lucky to be associated with both schools. I consider myself an alumni of both. Um, and feel really lucky and grateful to be able to participate uh, the Melbourne and New Zealand veterinary programs uh, through uh, opportunities like this. So appreciate you guys um, being a part of this evening. When I graduated New Zealand, I didn't stick around. I actually headed to straight to the UK as a new graduate um, and had a fantastic experience in the UK, I think at the time and probably still to this day, the the standard of uh, veterinary practice in the UK was extremely high. Um, and as we touched on a couple of weeks ago in the webinar, um, you know, the opportunities there to grow and expand my skills were tremendous. Um, really got a lot of great experience in, in, in the UK and, and simultaneously 
uh, did a business degree there uh, when I was in London, which really helped fill some of the gaps I, I, uh, I'd, I'd had since vet school. Um, and um, But I, I think the downside of working in the UK, perhaps a little bit similar to working in, in Australia, is uh, um, you know, the remuneration model for vets in the UK and Australia is somewhat similar. You know, there's sort of a set salary and you get sort of a ceiling effect where despite you know, growing as a veterinarian, you're not able to really increase your remuneration much. Um, the hours were long, the, the, uh, um, you know, the toll on my work-life balance was real. Um, and I was just a bit disenchanted with veterinary. Uh, I really wanted to own a veterinary practice. I'd tried to buy a number of hospitals and had failed, mostly because at that time there were a lot of corporate groups really buying these hospitals and I just couldn't get my foot in the door. And um, I sort of, you know, um, had sort of uh, got to the point where I was, you know, maybe looking to get out of veterinary practice. And uh, when I was at business school, I'd met some human hospital groups and, and uh, you know, they were interested in me sort of moving into a management role with them. And I was, you know, ready to sort of start my career in human healthcare when I got a phone call. And I got a phone call from a, uh, a buddy from Massey Vet School. He was a few years behind me. And he'd, uh, he'd moved uh, straight to California as a new graduate to start working in his uncle's vet hospital. And he called me up and he said, hey, Andrew, I really want to buy my uncle's vet hospital, but I don't know how to do it. Do you want to come and help me out? And so I thought this was my chance. And so I bought a one-way ticket to America. Um, and uh, I, uh, um, you know, fortunately, the accreditation I got from Massey was, uh, was, was useful. And... Um, came out with the intention of staying for a year or two and just feeling things out. And uh, I've been here ever since, almost, almost 10 years. And certainly uh, working in the States and California um, is, is incredible. Uh, it's really given me a lot of professional um, happiness and allowed me to achieve something that I, I really didn't feel I was able to achieve anywhere else in the world. So um, uh, certainly uh, been around the, the place, uh, you know, lived and worked in, in four different countries and you know it's given me some great perspectives and experiences uh, that um, that hopefully I can um, share with you uh, um, some of that stuff tonight so um, you know what are we doing now um, uh, vet and care is a uh, is um, one of the largest uh, communities of sort of independent uh, veterinary hospitals in America um, uh, and and I define independent by being veterinary owned and led uh, um, most other groups in fact all other groups in america of our size or above have some sort of outside ownership be that an outside uh, a sort of uh, a non-veterinary business um, uh, like you know the banfield group um, uh, obviously um, are owned by the mars family um, or some of these groups are um, owned by some private equity groups um, and that, you know, that impacts in, in some ways their ability to focus on, on um, uh, clinical care like we're able to do. Uh, we're also AHA accredited. Uh, it's a voluntary so veterinary uh, accreditation that, uh, um, that only about 15% of hospitals in the nation have. And that uh, also sort of sets us apart a little bit from a clinical perspective. So unlike most GPs, GP groups in America, um, you know, our level of clinical care is, is verging on specialty practice. Um, we, we really focus on sort of clinical advancement of our veterinarians. Um, uh, for instance, it's uncommon in America for general practitioners to really pursue advanced clinical care, where we have general practitioners doing TPLO and chemotherapy and advanced exotics and dentistry and all that type of thing, which is a bit unique. Um, we really focus on sort of collaboration, learning and mentorship, which is a bit unique in the States. Um, our model is based on sort of practice ownership. And certainly we encourage all our veterinarians to take an interest in sort of our equity um, ownership model. Um, and that's part of, of really helping our veterinarians uh, um, build um, some skills around financial planning and wealth creation. Um, and all of this is in an effort to help our vets grow professionally and, and really uh, supports their mindfulness and overarching happiness. So uh, that's what we're doing currently. We've got a presence in Northern California, Oregon, and Washington. Um, and um, yeah, that, that's where I am currently. So um, to our topic, 
uh, most importantly, wanted to start by just defining some of our objectives tonight. So um, uh, what I'm hoping for that you guys can get out of tonight is uh, um, uh, start by uh, sort of redefining student debt as self-investment. And we'll touch on that a bit later, what that means and, and why it's important. Um, love to help you guys understand the principles of investment and the concept of return on investment. Um, hoping to help you guys sort of assess your current student loans. Um, you know, if you're US citizens and you've done an undergraduate, you'll have loans in America. Um, and, and then how best to manage these in the future, you know, when you, you know, return to the US, um, you know, with your student debt, how can you manage that? Um, now, some of the information we're going to present tonight is, is specific to um, US citizens and, and US loans, um, but some of the strategies will apply to fee paying students, no matter where you're from. Um, hoping to outline some of the principles pivotal to sort of increasing your professional income, um, and, and, and you know, give you guys the confidence to you know, break the shadow, shackles of student debt and you know, realize some financial freedom. Um, and all of this is in an effort to really support vets from a mental health standpoint and remove some of the negative connotations associated with student debt so we can really um, you, you know, take a sort of proactive and positive attitude towards dealing with that. So to start, you know, how, what, what's the cost of education? You know, we, 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 we define the cost of veterinary school often just by looking at our student debt, but you know, the cost is arguably far greater. There's the, the student debt in its own regard. Um, and, and I think, you know, as mentioned, the average in America is about 180,000. Uh, many international students have much higher debt up to $400,000, including their undergraduate degree. Um, but, you know, there's a cost to us um, in our time, um, you know, for, for many folks who have done an undergraduate degree, we can be dedicating sort of, you know, anywhere from sort of seven to 10 years of time towards our veterinary qualification. Um, we're delaying other life goals, having a family, uh, all that type of thing, or other pursuits, um, the effect and impact and cost it has to our mental health, um, the risks of failure. Uh, for international students, the challenges and cost of moving internationally and setting up a new life for yourselves. Um, you know, why do we, why do we tolerate this, this, uh, this cost? And, and I, I think, um, you know, that's where I like to sort of define, you know, debt versus, versus an investment. And at a basic level, a debt is something we owe. Um, you know, we don't necessarily expect uh, a return from a debt. Uh, it's an obligation. And perhaps we've used it to buy something, but we don't always associate a debt with, with a return. Um, but when we're investing uh, so much money and time in something, um, and, and, uh, you know, and a definition I like you know, to define investment is one that says you know, it's an act of devoting money, time, effort, or energy to a particular undertaking with the expectation of a worthwhile result. And, and, and I think um, that's more applicable to what we're doing with our student debt. You know, it's an investment in ourselves in many respects. Um, and, and when we make an investment in ourselves uh, and an investment in money and time, um, we expect a return on that. And, and that return, part of which is, is becoming a veterinarian and having all the tremendous professional satisfaction that comes with that. Um, but there's got to be more to that. There, there simply has to be a financial return to allow us to um, create wealth for our families um, and, and, and gain a level of financial security. And this is a massive problem in the veterinary industry right now. In Australia, in the US, in England, few vets have financial security and are able to build adequate wealth for their families. And, and that's what we'll be focusing on today. Um, so, you know, what are some of the important things that you guys, uh, you know, want to have uh, as part of your lifestyle that, that, that you associate with being a professional? Now, I've, I've never met a veterinarian who really is driven by needing to drive a, a Porsche, uh, um, uh, but, but as veterinarians from an intrinsic level, um, you know, we want to have financial control. We want to have financial stability. In fact, it's hard to be your best professional self if you're not stable financially. Um, and I think, you know, hopefully you guys have um, had some lectures and awareness around mental health. It's certainly a, a really important topic right now in the veterinary industry. 
um, financial insecurity is, is a key component of that issue and, and something that, that affects vets all around, around, the, around the world. So, you know, as a professional, um, me personally, you know, I, I would like to quickly get to a position where I'm debt free. Um, I'd like to own a home. Uh, you know, I want to have a happy and healthy family, be they the human kind or the furry kind. Um, love to educate my kids at a high level. If you want to have a family, um, uh, have holidays, um, you know, a stable and secure retirement um, and the opportunity to, to create um, disposable wealth for your, yourself and your family um, for, for all the nice things you want to do. So, you know, they're things that should be really achievable for any professional. And the sad reality is for many veterinarians, they're not achievable because they don't have a financial plan to support that. So if we go back to some of those points, um, I think one of the first steps I take with students across the world when we start talking about student debt is we flip it on its head and we define it as it should be defined. You know, this is not a debt. It's really a self-investment. You know, it's a decision we're making to invest in ourselves and our future. And when we make an investment, we expect a return back on that. And, and, and I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about how we can measure that return and in, in fact, influence that return to maximize its impact on, on our lives. So I also tend to think that student debt has a pretty negative connotation. Self-investment just sounds a hell of a lot better. And uh, let's be honest, student debt and financial uh, topics like this aren't super sexy. Um, it certainly makes it a bit more exciting if it's a positive, uh, concept that we can we can celebrate and, and proactively influence such as self-investment. So um, certainly across the world, I work with vet schools to really sort of change their terminology for um, you know student debt and 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 call it what it is, which is really an investment in ourselves. So um, you know, let's talk a little bit about investment and why people take risks. Um, you know, entrepreneurship is the pursuit of opportunity beyond resources controlled. Um, so, uh, you know, certainly for me, becoming a veterinarian, um, part of the desire to become a vet was to, to take advantage of all the amazing opportunities that, that veterinarians have access to. And not all of that is, is, is about, you know, making money. A lot of it's like professional benefits of, you know, um, serving your patients at the highest level, um, uh, serving your clients, having great patient outcomes, building a great professional reputation, um, starting a practice, you know, all these cool things that, that I'd hope to do as a veterinarian. Um, and, and um, uh, you know, if that type of stuff excites you, then you may share um, some of the entrepreneurial spirit that, that I've always had. And I think certainly the vets who, who have an entrepreneurial spirit tend to be some of the most successful um, uh, you know, throughout their career. But you know, people take risks to, to achieve and return. And, and we measure uh, this, this return when we make an investment by a measure called return on investment, ROI. It might be a term you guys are familiar with. Familiar with. So at a basic level, uh, return on investment is simply our net profit, which is, you know, income, income minus our outgoings. So, you know, when, when you guys get paid as new veterinarians, you'll have to pay for your utilities and buy your food and your fuel and all that type of thing. Um, and, and, and you're left with a profit. Um, and then we divide that net profit by your total investment, multiply it by 100, and there's your return on investment. So net profit at the top, and, and uh, um, the, um, if my memory serves me correctly, that the, the, the top part of this ratio is, a, is the denominator and the numerator sits underneath. So if we increase the, the denominator on top, um, and and uh, feel free to correct me if I've got them back to forth. But but if we're increasing the number on the top, uh, your net profit, which we can do by either increasing your income or reducing your expenses, we improve your return on investment. Simultaneously, if we reduce the size of your total investment, then we can increase return on investment as well. The best idea is to reduce the size of your total investment and maximize your net profit which allows you to maximize your return on investment. And there's some of the concepts I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about today because this is the key component 
of building wealth um, and something that all veterinarians need to think about so that they can gain financial stability and control in their lives um, and, and build wealth for their, for their families. Um, certainly let me know if you guys have any questions. You can put a question in the chat or, or just, just shout out and unmute you guys, yourselves rather. So with regards to reducing the size of our total investment, in this instance, your total investment is your student debt or your self-investment as we like to call it. And so how can you guys minimize the size of that? Um, well, it starts with having a plan. And, and uh, um, certainly uh, you guys should be thinking about this, um, you know, at, at the very least in your final year of vet school, um, most students these days in America are thinking about their student debt position in their third year and getting more information on, on that. The best source out there is the VIN Foundation. And, and many of you guys will be familiar with VIN, the Veterinary Information Network. It's the world's biggest independence of veterinary network. And it's been a huge contributor to my success as a veterinarian, both clinically and professionally. As students, you guys get access to a free account. And if you're not a member of VIN, um, uh, I'd highly recommend you sign up and, and get involved with that. The VIN Foundation is VIN's charitable arm, and it's got a really big focus around um, new graduate success, mental health, and financial security. And, and it's got some tremendous resources for student debt management. And in fact, they're my main partner with regards to these presentations. Um, one of the key contributors to the VIN Foundation is Tony, Dr. Tony Bartels. Um, he's, he's a tremendous uh, chap who has um, supported me a lot with these presentations and supports a lot of the graduates that I work with around the world to help set them up like an individual um, uh, student uh, loan management plan. So um, VIN Foundation is your best spot for resources. Um, and, and we're going we're gonna to do a bit of a sort of uh, a little bit of a summary of that um, uh, now, um, and then I'm going to send you more information at the end of this presentation or, you know, in the next few days so that you guys can drill down and do that your research yourself. So um, when you get to the VIN Foundation, there is a student debt centre on there, and that's where you start. And, and um, you start by going to the My Student Loan section. We're going to play a short video in a moment uh, from, from Tony. He wanted to introduce himself. Um, he wanted to join live, but I, I thought we'd uh, um, not ask him to join us at 2 a.m. Uh, in, in California time. But he's done a short video for you guys, and he will show you some of these different pages that we utilize. Um, but in a nutshell, um, uh, you know, what you need to really uh, succeed on, at, in the Student Debt Center is your um, student aid data file. And this is something that everybody with a US student loan would have access to. And you can get that through studentaid.gov. And, and I will send everybody a link so that you can um, uh, go there and create an account. That gives you access to um, your, your um, historical student loans. And that file um, is specific to you and your debt obligations in America. Um, and it's that file that you need to save because you'll be importing that file into um, the VIN Foundation Student Debt Center to help you um, build a profile for, for, your, for your loans. So the next step you need to take is to complete the student debt and income signalment form. Now, I believe all you guys were sent a link about a week ago. Um, highly recommend that you try and complete that. Um, and um, we've sort of called a final deadline for completion of that form by next Wednesday. So highly recommend you take the time to do that. There are two benefits, or there are a couple of, probably three benefits that come from completing this. One, it helps you collect all the information that you're gonna need to put into the, to the student debt center to analyze your loans. So that, that's step one. Um, secondly, it will educate you on the size of your loans and, and also, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the terms of which you might have to repay them. Um, lastly, it gives Tony and I the capacity to assess uh, your, your loan status and give you feedback on that, particularly if there's anything that's particularly abnormal. 
And fourthly, it allows us to give the University of Melbourne some really good data on, on the, the, the debt status of your entire cohort um, with the hope that it will convince the school to allow me to present this uh, um, program to many more students so we can help um, everybody with, with a large debt position. So I highly recommend you guys um, complete that um, uh, subsignment form in the next week. Um, it's the, the link we've given you guys is specific to Melbourne Uni um, and will give us some really cool information. It all remains confidential, but it will really help me and Tony help you guys with your future student loan. Once you've completed to that, you're going to go to the Student Debt Centre on the VIN Foundation and specifically sort of my student, the My Students Loan section. And then there's going to be a couple of choices there, three choices, in fact. And you guys are going to select the one that pertains to a veterinary student. It's called I Have a Student Loan with More School to Go. And then you'll upload your student aid data file to that section. And through that, we're going to use the in-school loan estimator. That's going to ask you for some information. Um, and, and this is the information that you've collected as part of that sort of um, uh, debt and income signalment form. You're going to enter that and it's going to help estimate the, um, the, 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 the loans that you will accrue through the rest of your veterinary uh, um, degree. And it will give you um, a sort of total debt position um, that, that we can then uh, utilize uh, in the repayment simulator. So once you have that total that total loans position, um, you can use the student debt center to transfer that total to their repayment simulator. And, and that's the information that's gonna allow us to, uh, or for you to review your loan repayment summary, um, especially the monthly repayments and the total cost of that loan. You can then save and share that report. I'd highly recommend you save a copy of that and then through the VIN Foundation, and more specifically the student debt folder on VIN, you can, um, you can submit your report and, and uh, Tony, myself and others can help you personalize a student loan management plan. And that's the key of all of this because it is a, it's a confusing world out there. It's gonna be very hard for you to navigate that by yourself but by collecting that data and submitting it on VIN's um, uh, uh, student debt folder, um, the message boards, um, you can have a number of experts help you customize a plan for that. It can be anonymous if you wish, highly recommend that you make it public because any, everybody can learn from your unique position um, and, uh, and, 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 can, and can do better themselves. So in a nutshell, that is, is, is how we support um, uh, you know, veterinary students and graduates through their sort of loan management process. Um, now, um, in March last year, due to COVID-19, there were some significant changes in, in, the, um, uh, in the position of US current, current US loans, um, where it was called pandemic relief. So essentially, since March last year, your student loans, if you had them in the US, have not accrued interest. Uh, there have been no repayments necessary and that time that's gone by has gone towards your forgiveness. So an extraordinary event probably hasn't happened in more than a quarter of a century um, and it's been a great bonus for um, uh, people in America, uh, vets and others with student loans. Uh, but that's coming to the end uh, at the, uh, I believe on the 1st of October. Um, so certainly for your existing student loans, highly recommend that you uh, become familiar with your loan obligations. Um, I'd highly recommend ending the grace period early and looking at consolidating your loans and coming up with a good plan for those loans. Um, many of these loans, if they're not appropriately managed, default into a 10 year repayment plan, which is really bad for you financially. Um, and simultaneously these days, we really wanna help you guys consolidate. Let's, you guys could have, if you've done an undergraduate degree, you could have you know, three to five different loans, all on different plans. And these days we work with students to really try and consolidate those loans, select the appropriate plan. So while you're at veterinary school, your existing loans from undergrad are in the right plan and are appropriately consolidated. So just because you're a student and you're still going through your vet degree does not mean you can't have a robust plan for your existing loans from your undergrad degree. So it's really important you guys don't forget about that. And all these tools I've given you will allow you to do that successfully. 
So certainly uh, let me know if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat now or you can email me after the fact. Okay, so I'm just going to um, um, change the sharing uh, profile on my screen and we're going to just play a short video that, uh, um, that Dr. Bartels uh, wanted to uh, present to you guys just so he can introduce himself um, and uh, uh, forgive me one moment. Um, he just wanted to introduce yourself and give you a brief summary of the Venn Foundation. So hopefully you guys can hear this and uh, certainly let me know if there's any technical glitches on your end, but uh, it's only three minutes long. Hopefully it gives you a bit of information and introduces you guys to Tony. Veterinary students, I'm Dr. Tony Bartels with VIN, the Veterinary Information Network and VIN Foundation, um, coming to you from Denver, Colorado. I specialize in helping our veterinary colleagues with U.S. federal student loans and understanding the complex world of repayment. So why would I do that? Well, because I have a particular interest in finance. Uh, I came from the corporate finance world before uh, vet school, and I did a combined MBA DVM program at Colorado State University. But more importantly, uh, both my wife and I have a boatload of U.S. federal student loans from veterinary school that we manage using a non-traditional federal income-driven repayment strategy. For those of you with federal student loans, your repayment options go way beyond simply paying your loans back as fast as possible or using a traditional time-driven repayment strategy. However, navigating those options can be complicated. The Indian Vin Foundation have tried to simplify student loans and repayment strategies for veterinarians so you can move past this financial side effect of becoming a veterinarian and, and get back to the things that matter, like treating and keeping animals all over the world um, healthy. So here's how you can get started. So we're going to come over to the Vin Foundation Student Debt Center. Uh, this is a publicly available resource. Uh, anybody can use it, but it's designed specifically for veterinarians and veterinary students. Um, you're gonna need two things. Uh, your federal student aid data file, that's an ugly looking text file that contains your history of borrowing with the US Department of Education. We have instructions on this page, as well as another video that can help you obtain that file if you need those instructions. Um, but you also wanna have your VIN username and password. While you don't have to be logged in to use the Student Debt Center, it helps to be logged in. and all veterinary students have free access to VIN uh, during veterinary school. So I would highly encourage you to activate that free membership. There's an enormous amount of helpful information on VIN to help you navigate uh, this profession of veterinary medicine uh, and student loans and repayment options, just, just one tiny sliver of that, that VIN universe. But the benefit of being logged in here is, is twofold. Uh, it's gonna help you save that file that you upload and it also provides you access to the uh, VIN Foundation student uh, debt message board folder, right? So this is where you would log in uh, using your VIN credentials, right? You can see I've got several files that are saved here, so I can pull up one that's been recently uploaded and analyze that information as well as get to the student debt message board folder, uh, which allows me to get a personalized consultation, get the answers that you need for your student loan specifics, or you can browse all of the cases that have been posted here previously. So check out those resources that are available to you. Um, ask a lot of questions and plan ahead. Uh, student loans and repayment becomes much less stressful when you have a plan. So we want to empower you with the information you need to help build that plan. So good luck with the rest of veterinary school and please let us know how we can help. Okay, folks, hopefully, oh. Hi, veterinary students. Just gonna uh, minimize that and get back to where we were. Okay, so hopefully you guys uh, got, got that video. Um, Tony is a really great guy. Uh, I've known him for a long time now. His knowledge uh, with regards to student loans is incredible and He's really helped me personally um, sort of understand them in detail and uh, 
alongside myself has really helped a lot of uh, students and, and graduates around the world really get on top of their student debt. So um, feel confident reaching out to him through the Venn Student Debt Centre. Um, I also can be a, be a resource as you navigate that. And uh, um, uh, oftentimes when we, when we uh, I come to schools in person, you know, we do a deeper dive into going through that. But if you do complete that uh, student debt income and, and uh, sort of debt and income signalment form, we can certainly get started on helping set you up with a plan. So if we look back at our return on investment, um, the, the, some of the tools we've just suggested are going to help you guys reduce the size of your investment. Um, and, and the main way they do that is to set you up for student loan forgiveness. So we used to think that it was the smartest thing to pay off your student loan as quickly as possible. Um, and you know that would make sense, certainly applies to other types of debt, doesn't it? If you've got a car loan or a credit card debt, you, know, you always wanna pay them off as quickly as possible. It is very different with student debt. Uh, the best strategy these days is to actually pay the very minimum uh, stretch that debt out over its, its, its term. And the plans we use these days typically have a 25 year term. Um, and then um, uh, it, it's almost certain, particularly if your debt is over a certain level and your debt to income ratio is greater than one, which is pretty typical for all veterinarians, then you're gonna be eligible for forgiveness at that 25 years. And that forgiveness um, uh, forgives 40 to 60% of your student loans. Um, and that greatly reduces the size of your investment. Now, the one um, consideration for that forgiveness is it is taxable income. So you need to pay tax on that. And that, that tax payment can be substantial. So when we talk to graduates and students about setting up their repayment plan, part of that is a strategy around saving for that tax payment. Um, and, and there's some, some, well, some well thought out strategies around that. So they're the techniques we employ to reduce the size of your investment. Now, if you recall that return on investment ratio um, uh, is net income divided by total investment. So we've reduced our total investment. That's great. That's gonna return our return, uh, that's gonna increase our return on investment already just by doing that. But how do we maximize our return on investment? Well, we not only reduce the size of our investment, but we increase our income, okay? And, and there are a number of, of ways to do that. And, and uh, these are strategies that we, we um, uh, you know, um, talk about with students around the world and, and, and talk about uh, with graduates as well. Um, and you're probably familiar with some of these things, they may not be things that, that your vet schools have talked to you about or, or coached you on. So when it comes to increasing income, um, there's uh, um, some different strategies based on where you are in the world. So in Australia and the UK, it's fairly common for graduates to work five to six days a week. Um, now, um, you can't do that forever because it obviously affects your, your sort of work-life balance. Certainly in America, they've made a step forward in sort of work-life balance, and, and it's customary for many veterans to work four days a week um, over here. Um, now, they're long days, but, but it's still different um, to, to what's happening in Australasia and the UK. We highly recommend that new graduates considering work, consider working five days a week, and there's some distinct benefits to that, and, and that sort of embraces my philosophy on working more, not less. There will be a point in your careers where you want to work less. Um, if you um, have a family or if you have other interests that you want to pursue, you may want to work less at that time. But to set you up uh, to be successful for that, um, uh, you know, sort of different schedule, um, you obviously want to have some financial security. And certainly working more can aid your capacity to build financial stability for yourself. If you're working five days over four days, you potentially increase your income by 125%. Most importantly for our graduates, the benefit of working five days is you increase your caseload by 125%. And we, we see our graduates who work five days a week, that correlates with a greater um, uh, growth in skills and experiences with caseload. So, so that might be a first recommendation to consider as a new graduate. 
um, certainly expanding experiences and caseload is part of that sort of, that, uh, is sort of um, increased workload. But also we want to make sure that you're getting access to a diverse caseload. Um, and, 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 and part of that is joining a practice that really celebrates a diverse uh, uh, group of disciplines. So you want to work in a practice where they do do urgent care, they do surgery, they do advanced imaging, they do exotics, they do dentistry. Trying to find a practice that exposes you to all those, those uh, different cases, because then you get confidence in those different cases and you can um, uh, see more patients. And when you see more patients, you certainly in, in, in the UK, in the US rather, um, you are remunerated at a higher level. Um, now, seeing more patients doesn't just come from gaining more confidence in different disciplines. It comes from being efficient. And there, there's a lot of uh, ways that you can do that and get better at that. Better time management. Um, uh, having a really great tech team around you and actively supporting the training of your technical team with other people in the practice. Um, uh, Fit-ins, um, opening up your schedule uh, um, if you don't have surgeries to see patients, blocking off the schedule for surgeries, expanding your skill set so you can see more and, and support more patients. These are all um, uh, uh, good tactics to be more efficient. Embracing technology, telemedicine, um, electronic record systems, all of these things allow you to be more efficient and see more patients. So certainly a focus on that uh, is, is important. Um, advancing your, your clinical skills. This allows you to uh, refer less. Um, and if you're seeing a more advanced caseload, you're able to serve those patients at a higher level and certainly in countries like the US, that leads to a higher level of remuneration. Um, and lastly, and this is in the sort of an early um, strategy when you join the veterinary profession, but longer term, um, having some level of ownership in a practice through an equity share holding, um, it dramatically allows you to improve your, your income. And certainly in America here, a lot of the vet schools these days are telling students that if you've got more than $200,000 of debt, the only way to really uh, create a return on that is some form of ownership in veterinary practice. And that's something that, that is certainly an important consideration. So we do have a bit of a, um, I've got an ROI comparison um, that I will send you guys after the fact to have a look through. It's pretty eye-opening. And in that comparison, we look at a veterinarian who joins uh, the profession as a new graduate. Um, and uh, in this example, this, um, uh, uh, this, this veterinarian um, doesn't truly embrace uh, our concept of clinical advancement. Um, now that might be their own doing where they just don't have a passion for, for growing their clinical expertise. It might be that they're in a bad practice where they're not being mentored at a high level. But either which way, this veterinarian grows their income at a pretty slow level because of that lack of growth clinically and professionally. Um, we then compare that to a veterinarian who joins the profession and actively and, and quickly grows their skill set and capacity as a professional and therefore increases their income much more quickly. In that scenario, we also add in a circumstance where that vet, aspiring veterinarian, um, I think at five years, becomes an owner in a practice. And then we look at how that scenario compares to the first and the difference in return on investment. Um, the, the difference will surprise you and I think give you some indications on how we can influence um, our return on investment on our self-investment, our student debt, um, dramatically by focusing on a few different aspects of, of veterinary practice. Okay. So some of the key tips that, that I think are important to focus on if you guys want to maximize your financial success as veterinarians, and at the very least have financial stability and control in your life. Um, man, minimize and manage your debt obligation. We've been over that. There's lots of great resources. I'm happy to help you do that. Um, increasing your professional income. Uh, and, and mostly as a graduate, that's about advancing your clinical skill sets um, towards excellence and focusing on your efficiency and, and, and being the best professional you can be. Obviously, that's easier in a great practice where you have good mentors 
Um, and that's a really important consideration of, of, of joining practice as a new graduate. And we touched on that last webinar. If you weren't able to join us, please watch the recording and, and that will give you some really good focal points to, to, uh, to, to, to uh, really narrow in on when you're looking for uh, your, your, your first job as a, as a new graduate. It's really important for you guys to develop responsible behaviours and personal finance. Uh, there's a great resource in America called drip.vet. All veterinary students are allowed to join that free of charge. It's a partnership with the VIN Foundation and it gives you, it drips you little bits of finan personal financial uh, information and tips. Really great, highly recommend you guys subscribe to that. Um, certainly uh, for a lot of students and veterans across the world, managing credit card debt is something that's really, really important. Um, I, I, I do a, um, a series of, of lectures at University of, of Melbourne um, for, for the first and second years on this very topic. If you guys want more tips and, and information on that, happy to provide um, the, the, the content that we provide to those students. Um, retirement. This is really something you won't be thinking about now. I certainly wasn't at vet school. Um, you know, the, the gift of youth, you think you're never going to get old. Um, uh, trust me, you get old and, and uh, your body starts to fall apart. I mean, I, I, I think vet school was just yesterday, but holy moly, you know, it's been 16 years. And thinking about retirement um, from the day you start in practice is really important. And I highly recommend you guys to try and put away 10% of your income to your retirement plan. It, it's so important. Um, you really want to max out any other tax-free um, vehicles that, that you can utilise. And, and by vehicle, I don't mean a car. I, I mean um, uh, health savings account and things like that. We certainly had them here in the US. And you can, you can put money into a health savings account tax-free. And it's an extraordinary way to create tax-free wealth for yourself. Um, and your future um, healthcare needs. I'm certain there'll be things like that in Australia and the UK as well. Certainly over here, um, it's a great way to, to sort of build wealth for yourself and, and also ensure that you're taken care of from a, from a healthcare perspective. We encourage all graduates to think about trying to build up an emergency fund of sort of three to six months of, 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 of expenses. Um, and certainly longer term. Um, and we encourage you know, new graduates these days to, to really consider and, and get excited about the potential of practice ownership. It really is the best way longer term to create financial success for yourselves and your families. And lastly, advance your clinical skills. Advance your clinical skills, advance your clinical skills. You know, the concept of continued improvement, never stop learning. Um, it's always sad to me when I meet veterinarians who just have given up uh, um, continued improvement and, and aren't interested in learning anymore. Um, every day I continue learning and I think really to be the best professionals we can be for our patients, we have to take that, you know, embrace that philosophy. But if you continue to advance your skills, then you will continue to um, uh, serve your patients and clients at a higher level. And in America, that indirectly affects your level of remuneration and, and leads to a better level of financial success. So there, there, there's some of the, the tips that I have for you guys. Veterinary practice ownership, um, this in its own right, you know, we could do a full lecture on, but in a nutshell, practice ownership allows you to build a, a much greater level of wealth than you can do as an employee. It allows you to pay off your debt more, more quickly. And, and I know we talked about that earlier as not being the right tactic, but it, at the very least, being an owner allows you to much more quickly save that tax uh, fund that you're going to need to sort of pay off your forgiveness, uh, your forgiveness in 25 years. Um, and then there's just the professional fulfillment of owning your own practice. Building your own legacy is one of the best things I've ever done. And, and it really feels great to be able to, you know, lead a veterinary hospital and influence the level of care in your practice, which you just can't do if you're a part of a, a corporate, corporate group. I've really put it on the vet schools, you know, that the high cost of education that, that the vet schools sort of put upon your shoulders really mandates that they you know, really get behind giving you guys the skills to, to be successful financially um, and get a return on your self-investment. And that includes vet schools doing more to give you guys business and leadership skills, really uh, like um, 
uh, um, ignite the fire um, for your interest in veterinary practice ownership and, and encouraging clinical advancement amongst general practitioners. Really, really important for, for veterinarians to be successful. Um, and it's something that's sadly um, pretty poorly covered at most uh, vet schools across the world. In our last webinar, we touched on uh, um, uh, happiness and, and how important it is for veterinary professionals these days to, to think about their happiness. And we went through a bit of an exercise of looking at how these three different rings um, uh, make up our overarching happiness. And I think certainly for me and other veterinary professionals, you know, we break our sort of happiness down into sort of three different rings. The, the professional happiness that we get from being a veterinarian, our personal happiness and our financial happiness. And all of these um, are, are interrelated and impact one another. However, it's pretty hard to have personal happiness if you're not happy at work professionally and if you're not happy and secure financially. Um, and, and that's where we tend to focus. Uh, well, that's certainly that's where I tend to focus a lot of my efforts internationally for, from an education perspective, but also with our own veterinarians who work within our group. We really focus on allowing them to be the happiest they can be professionally and also work to support them financially. Because if you get those things right, it's much easier to be happy in your personal life. And strangely, well, not, not so strangely, we tend to see much lower incidences of depression and mental health in veterinarians who are really happy professionally and have financial security. And that's when we, why we tend to focus our, our efforts there. I'm not gonna go through this full analysis because we've done it previously and you guys should certainly have access to uh, the webinar from two weeks ago. Feel free to listen to that and email me if you have any questions. My hope is that all of this leads to a much improved uh, state of the profession, a, a world where you know vets are happy and, and able to lead an industry where they can focus on patients and clients and, and through that uh, build a greater level of wealth creation uh, or wealth for themselves and their families to reward them for the extraordinary contribution they make um, uh, uh, to, to the lives of our, our pets and, and our pet parents. And, and hopefully through that, we see uh, a, a decrease in some of the mental health issues that are, that are affecting the industry today. So that's all we've got, folks. Uh, we're on time. Um, I, uh, I have uh, uh, nowhere else to go and, and more than happy to spend some time with you guys if you have any questions. Certainly, that, um, the, the email address at the top is my personal email address at work. You guys can uh, certainly email me. Um, Courtney's email is at the bottom there. Um, Courtney and her team support um, our, um, uh, all, all of our graduates who join our new graduate program. We do have our own program and, and uh, uh, the Australasian cohort starts in September each year. So if you guys feel that um, uh, um, our group uh, may be a fit for you and you intend to sort of move to the, to, um, the west coast of, of the states, then um, uh, you know, we'd love you to consider um, our uh, clinical advancement program, which might be a, a suitable fit for you guys as you enter practice as new graduates. But um, happy to open up the floor. I think you guys are on on uh, on mute, but you should be able to unmute yourself. And if you have any questions, happy to answer any. Okay, well, cool, folks. Well, if no one's got any questions, don't hesitate to email me um, and uh, appreciate your joining tonight. I uh, hope you enjoy your evenings and, and I hope tonight was of use and look forward to hearing from you all soon. Thanks so much.